All right, in this video, I'm going to take a look at how to evaluate a guitar, specifically a 1970s Martin Dreadnought. I'm going to look at how to evaluate this for purchase. I've got another video on how to evaluate a guitar, but I looked at that more from the standpoint of a repairman as to what am I going to do to this guitar um, to get it right. Now, the two things are similar, but I want to give you a little bit more of a... Um, uh, a little bit more of a step-by-step -step thing uh, in, in the order that you need to look at them when you're looking at a guitar for purchase. This guitar was purchased recently, and the new owner is surprised at a couple of things about it. <laughs> so we're going to try to find out how you could look at this guitar before you're getting ready to buy it and look at the trouble spots, potential trouble spots, and just know more about the guitar. You know, know what you're buying here. Um, and again, like I said, specifically the 1970s Martin D28 in this case. But these things will work with um, almost every guitar, except for the exception probably of the bridge location. And so we're going to start with that right now. The number one thing. Number one thing on a 70s Martin Dreadnought is the bridge location. Where is the bridge? Now, for a period of time from about 1970 to 1977, maybe even into 78 a little bit, the bridge on many Martin D's is misplaced. It's an eighth of an inch too far forward, which uh, up, to, up to a quarter of an inch sometimes, and that will make the guitar play sharp. Now, not all of them. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen a handful. I mean, I like to say not all of them, but almost every single Martin D from 1970 to 1978 that comes into my shop has a misplaced bridge. I understand that's a small sample size because I am a hospital, basically. So I'm looking at sick Martin guitars, you know, but it is the first thing that I would check on a guitar. Now, on a Martin D, you can't necessarily go strictly by the intonation because a lot of these are going to need a neck reset also, which is a separate thing we're gonna look at here. So if it needs a neck reset and the action is really high like it is on this guitar, you can't, you can't do that because the stretching of the string to come down off of that high action is going to make it intonate sharp right off the bat. So just checking the intonation that way is not a good way to do it. The best way to do it, in my humble opinion, is to measure. And you get yourself a yardstick or a tape measure, whatever you want to use. Now granted, it's kind of hard to carry around this in your back pocket when you go into a guitar shop. But you can carry a small tape measure, you see. You can carry a small tape measure. It's only got to go 13 inches, so, you know. Okay, now the way to do this, the way I do it, therefore the correct way, <laughs> no, the way I do this, is to take the end of this, put it right in the middle of the 12th fret. Not on the forward edge of the fret, not on the back edge of the fret, right smack in the middle. And, you know, if you're off of the middle just a hair, it's not going to make any difference, but... I guarantee it'll make a little bit of a difference if you go to the forward edge of the fret. Um, and you can, you know, you can have measure however you want to as long as you do it consistently. So let's go to the forward edge of the fret just for fun on this, yeah. Let me see how much difference it makes. Well, I know it'll make 80 thousandths of an inch, but... Okay, so I go to the middle of the fret, 12th fret, and I look at my mark up here, and you can see them right here. Right at 12 and 7 eighths of an inch and just a, just a hair past, you know, not, not even all the way, but just a hair past 12 and 7 eighths of an inch is where the contact point of the saddle should be. Not the front of the saddle, not the rear of the saddle, the contact point of the low E on the saddle. So that is the middle of the saddle, okay? So the middle of the 12th fret to the middle of the saddle on the low E should be right around 12 and 7 eighths and this one is 
good shot at eighth of an inch off. There you go. I don't even have to go measure the treble, but if I want to, I can. And it should be right around 12 and 3 quarters of an inch. And it also is an eighth of an inch off. It is 12 and uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 eighths. So it's off by an eighth of an inch. You want to verify that measurement, okay? There's, um, I like redundancy. I like to measure the same thing in two different ways, three different ways, just to make sure I've got that solution. Or I've got the problem nailed down. So again, on a Martin, D18, D21, DA28, all of the 14 fret Ds, the front edge of the bridge, to the edge of the body here is about 11 and an eighth of an inch. So take your measuring stick, put your finger up here against the edge of the body, push it up there. And again, this is not a super exact measurement. It just gives you an idea to verify here. And this one is boom, 11 inches. So I'm an eighth of an inch off, which is what the saddle says too. Come over here to this edge. And, you know, it's funny how, how crooked these bridges are. Let me get this straight here. Another way you can measure this is take something like this, flop it up against the body, and then butt your stick up against it like that. But it's not quite square. But anyway, 11 inches. Come over to here. 11 inches. I actually have a little tool that does that for me when I'm setting the bridges. But I still measure. <laughs> because it was using an incorrect template that got Martin into this problem in the first place and that's why I like to measure and I don't like to use templates all that much. I like to measure each one of them. All right, this bridge is an eighth of an inch, eight of an inch out of position. It's going to have to be corrected if you want to play in tune. At the end of this video, I'm going to have, you look for the little title, look for the timing mark, I will show you your options for correcting this, but for right now, what you need to know as a buyer is that this, this bridge is one eighth of an inch out of position. It's never going to play in tune. And people say, oh, well, I don't play up here, you know? Yeah, but you're going to be out of tune at the third fret. And I guarantee you, you won't be as much as you were at the 12th or the 9th or the 7th, but you will be out of tune at the third fret. So if you play so-called cowboy chords, you might be able to get away with it, but to me, it's out of tune. Especially when I'm used to hearing guitars that are in tune. So your bridge is out of, out of position. We'll have to deal with that. We'll do that later. Okay. Step two. On this guitar. Now that you know the bridge is out of location, you might want to walk away. You might want to deal with it. You know, whatever. It depends on the price. Depends on whether you own the guitar already. Whatever. Second thing you want to look at now is the action. You want to check the action. Action is defined as the height from the string to the fret. Therefore, I can talk about the 12th fret action. I can talk about the 6th fret action. I can talk about the 1st fret action. I can talk about the relief action. But in this case, we're going to talk about the 12th fret action because that's a standard for measuring how high the strings are off the fingerboard and how well the guitar is going to play. The reason you use the 12th fret is because it's halfway to the saddle. So if I have to adjust this 10 thousandths of an inch, it's going to take 20 thousandths roughly over here at the saddle. Okay? That's why we use the 12th fret on mandolins, guitars, everything. A lot of electric guitar players like to use like the 17th or the 24th or something. I use the 12th because it keeps me um, everything consistent. Okay, so to measure at the 12th, you're looking for the distance from the top of the fret to the bottom of the string. I don't care from the fingerboard to the string because that doesn't take into effect the, the that doesn't take into account the height of the fret. And when you fret a string, it's from the bottom of the string to the top of the fret. So, that's what you measure. You can use a ruler if you want to. I find rulers to be pretty inaccurate. I don't like them that much, but what you do, and they also rock back and forth. What you do is you set it on the 12th fret, 
and you read the tiny little numbers that are underneath the string, which again, I have trouble doing. You know, I don't like to look at that. And plus, you're trying to get this thing to where if you walk into a guitar store, you've got your little tools with you. You can make a little tool bag or something like that, you know, but a six inch ruler, get yourself a pair of feeler gauges. Available at fine auto parts stores and Walmarts everywhere. Five bucks. You fold them up. You can use these to measure the nut height, the relief, 12th fret action, the height of the saddle off the bridge, I mean the height of the frets. You can use them to measure so many things with this one tool. You can adjust the valves on your dirt bike if you want to. I have a better set for that. Anyway, what you do is you stack them. You get a bunch of them together. And I know that when I see a 14, I almost read 14 is 90 thousandths these days. So that's 90 thousandths of an inch right there. So that's 3 30 seconds of an inch, basically. Put the guitar up here on your shoulder like this. And I get questions sometimes, well, doesn't that change the action? No, it, golly, I mean, I can't see it. It's not changing it significantly. You know, I don't see that action flopping back and forth. So no, it's not gonna. It's not really gonna do it, especially when you put it right here in the middle of your neck. The reason you know, I do this is so that I can see the sliver of the light under here. I get my eye down here, hold your feeler gauge flat, push them down to your finger to get all the little things tight. Push it down on the fret, slide it under here, and all I want to know at this point is that this is 90 thousandths of an inch, so that's 3, three thirty seconds of an inch, which is a very good standard action for the 12th fret low E. And all I care about at this point is that that is really high. It's twice that. So you don't even have to see it, although if you look at this, I can see the shadow. I've got the light over there, and I can see the shadow of the string on the feeler gauge and there's a massive gap under there. If I walk my feeler gauge back and forth like this, I can see the shadow, make a V or make a V. And then I know my feeler gauge is on flat with the string. What I want us to see is a parallel shadow. I want to see a shadow going the same distance all the way across the feeler gauge. You'll see what I'm talking about as soon as you do this. So I put it down there and I can see an even shadow if I tilt my feeler gauge, the shadow contacts. The shadow and the string come together, so that's not right. Get your feeler gauge flat, roughly. Massive action. Massive action. So this guitar probably needs a refret. Step number three. <clears throat> Why is the action high? Now, you've got a couple options here. Is the action high because the neck is perfect and the body's just collapsed? You know, whatever. There's some other factors into why it might need a neck reset. You need to look at those. The first thing we're going to do to look at those other things, check the neck relief. The neck relief will affect the action. This has a non-adjustable truss rod, so you can't just crank on the truss rod, but with an adjustable truss rod, you could. And if the neck relief is way out, you'll adjust the truss rod, the action will go down, and you may find out you don't need a neck reset anymore. Um, you'll see, the truss rod is not used to adjust the action, but the truss rod can affect the action. It's an important distinction. So the way, that I like to check the relief, actually measure it, is put a capo on the first fret right here, so that gives me a free hand now. Put the guitar back up on my shoulder, put the capo there. And I like to get myself about six thousandths of an inch of feeler gauge here. So here's a six. Hold the fret down at the uh, 13th fret, so that it's captive over the second, I'm um, over the 12th. Hold it at the 13th fret, and it's pinned at the 12th fret. Come up here to the 7th, 6th, come to the 6th fret, and measure. So here's your 5th fret, here's your 7th fret, here's your 6th fret. 
and that sucker clears the six thousandths by a lot. All I know at this point is the pass or fail. I'm not really looking for an exact measurement here. If it was below six thousandths, that'd be fine, you know. Then I would go, then what I would do is just take it like this and do this and see if I have any relief. Because if I have any relief whatsoever, then you're great. If it if the six fails, but there's a sliver of light, that is perfect. Then you've got a nice flat neck. Can't go any more with the relief, it's really good. In this case, I'd kind of like to know what the relief actually is, so I'm going to load up a 12 here. Here's a 12 thousandths of feel of gaze, and we're going to see what we got here. Hold it down to 13th fret, come back to the 6th, and again, I'm looking at that same sliver of light right here. It may help if you're old like me, you can pop your glasses down. I can bear to get that 12 under there. I'd be pretty comfortable with calling this 10 thousandths of an inch because I might be bumping that low E just a little bit. So I'm going to call that maybe 10 thousandths of an inch of neck relief. That's just a little bit too much for me. Um, here's the problem with high relief. I talk about this in some of my other videos, but quickly. The problem with high relief is that the neck is not flat on the body. You see this yardstick? This is going straight down the body. Pick guards in the way. It's going straight down the body, and it comes up to here. Your neck does not do that. Your neck is on the body at an angle, about a two degree angle, like this, you see? And I can prove that by coming over here to this side, and this neck angle is a little bit off, so it's, this is gonna show this. And the plane of the fingerboard falls below the plane of this, so the neck is on the body at an angle, right? It has to be for the fingerboard and everything, the fingerboard is lower than the height of the bridge and the saddle combined. So the neck has to be in an angle in order to send the strings up to that plane. So, the problem with this is that if your neck relief, this is your neck, okay? If your neck relief is like this, where the neck rose up above the plane of the body, then your strings would just simply be higher. But that's not what happens. Your neck is down here like this. So the neck relief pulls this neck up like this. And I'm going to rest it right on that tuner here to illustrate this. And what happens is you have a dip right here and a hump. People incorrectly call this the 14th fret hump. It's not a hump up here. This is a hump, you see. That's an actual rise in the fingerboard. That's not what's going on. What this is is a dip in the area from about the third of the ninth fret. It's a dip in the middle of the neck like this. This makes, when you're fretting a string right here, that string has to come up over this hump, over this rise out of the dip. And the string has to come up out of the dip and it'll buzz right here. Now, if this was flat, this and this neck right here has no relief in it you can see you don't have that problem there's no dip and there's no coming up out of the dip to deal with that's why a flatter neck is better in my humble opinion the only reason that you need relief at all is to show that the neck's not back bug. so in other words if you went like this and the string was flat on that fret how would you know that it wasn't back bowed like this. You see, you wouldn't. You've got to have a little bit of, of gap in there to show you that the neck is not totally, it is not back bowed, okay? So for instance, when I set the valves on my KX250 dirt bike motorcycle four stroke, you get your feeler gauge in there and it's super small tolerances. And let's say you go in there and the 03 does not pass. And it really doesn't pass because you're dealing with metal on metal. And it goes, thunk, and it bumps on there. Yeah. 
So you go to zero, zero, two, bump, does not pass. So how much do you adjust the valves? Well, see, you don't know because you don't have a pass-through figure in order to calculate from. For all I know, at this point, the cam could be pushing down on the valve and holding it open, you see. I don't know. Until I get a gap that I can measure, I have no idea what's going on. That's the only reason you need relief on the neck. To show that you can measure and say that it's not back boat. Okay? It really isn't. A lot of people think, oh, you know, you need the room for the string to vibrate. Well, no, you really don't. Because when you fret the third fret right here, and you play it right here, which is three or four inches away, you set up nodes on the guitar strings, and there's a node here. It's this distance, basically. This distance, this distance, this distance. You set up nodes up and down the neck. The string does not vibrate like this. Like if you were to a, a clothesline pole and flap it from the end. That's not what happens here because you're plucking the string here. If you could pluck the string at the end and flap it up in the yes, then you'd have, but you still have nodes, you know? You'd have waves that go like this. It doesn't go up and down in the middle. It goes in waves. And it turns out that the peaks of those waves, when you make a G chord and you hit the string about right here, it turns out that the peak of the wave is about right here, about right here, and about right here. Relief does not affect here, it doesn't affect this, and it barely affects this area here. As soon as you put a capo on the second fret, Like a bluegrass player would play, because a lot of guys say, oh, bluegrass players need a relief. No, they don't. You go up here and you make a G chord here at the fifth fret. You're going to play here, your note's going to go here. So your first note is going to be about right there, and neck relief has zero effect. Right there. Right there, right there, right there. Neck relief has no effect right here. You're already climbing out of the hole right there, so. The only reason for neck relief so that you can see your neck's not back bowed. If the humidity changes a little bit, you know, your neck might back bow from humidity, you need to have a little bit of working room in there. So, this guitar is about 10 thousandths of an inch in neck relief. That's going to keep it from having a low action. If I set the action down to where it's low and really comfortable, it's going to start buzzing right in here because, because it has too much neck relief and not because the action is low. Okay. Number four, having checked the bridge location, the 12th fret action, the neck relief, now your next step is to check the nut action. And the quick and dirty way to do this is to hold the string down between the second and the third frets so that it's pinned back here on the second fret. And it should absolutely barely clear the first fret. And this one doesn't. This one's really high. I mean, I'm moving quite a bit right there and a very very small amount here is going to make a big difference when it's open so nuts pretty high the B string looks good you know the B string is barely clearing so the, low, the high E is high the G is really good it's just barely kissing that fret the D might actually be a little low if you think it's low go from the second and third fret move down one fret give it a little bit more See what you think there. Do you get clearance here? No, I don't. <laughs> so the D string is, is probably too low, just a little. A string is perfect. E string is okay. It's just it's a smidgen low. I've got clearance when I moved from the third. That's a quick and dirty check for for the nut uh, slots. I think this nut needs a little bit of attention. Probably what I would do is simply just shim it up with a piece of sandpaper. Super glued to the bottom. You could use a piece of mahogany or whatever you wanted to do, but a piece of sandpaper is about six thousandths of an inch thick, which is going to be just about perfect for this. The other thing that I'm going to want to do on the nut, 
I'm considering whether or not I should replace the net. If a couple of slots are high, low, you know, should I just replace it? So the second thing I'm going to look at on the nut is the spacing. And this, by the way, is not the stock nut. And I can tell that because, first of all, it's bone. And it would be my carter or ivory on this one. And I can see a tiny little gap right here where the front of the nut's rounded away. And there's nothing wrong with that. I do that too sometimes. And that's to give clearance for all the old glue and junk that, you know, that's up there. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's a good-looking nut. Let's see what the spacing between the strings is. Let me get my calipers for this. You can do it the quick and dirty way by just using your finger. You know, feel for that. Does it feel even? You know, it does. It's not bad. I mean, it looks even. So I'm just going to take a quick check here. Um, and I'm in millimeters. I don't want to be in millimeters. I want to be in inches. Thank you. 53. 60. 76, 60, 61. So I basically have three gaps of the 60s and then a couple bigger. So let me check again. 53, 60, 77. So I got 20 thousandths of an inch more room between the D and the G than I have between the E and the A. So. To me, that's going to make the E feel cramped because it's closer up there. It's like putting basketball, drawing equal lines on the ground, and putting the basketball, a volleyball. What's next? Um, a softball <laughs> and a tennis ball. The distance between the, the basketball and the volleyball, they may actually touch each other, you know. The edges might actually touch each other if your shinners are close enough. And you know that's not going to feel good. It's going to be feel a lot better to have the same space between them. Well, that's the problem here. I'd probably replace this nut then. Or I might use some little some trickery here. Let me look at this again. Let me think about this. 55. The 60 is not too bad. But I can't move it this way. i got to move it that way. 75. 60. 62. Okay, so these two spaces here are both in the 60s. The A needs to move over and the D needs to move over. That's all that's got to happen here. So, the D was low and the G was a little low. No, the D was low, only the D. So, you know what I might do on this nut? Instead of making a brand new nut and everything, probably what I might do on this one just cut the slot down deep and then fill it in with a piece of bone like this. I use super glue and make as close of a fit as I can here. Super glue that in there, fill in that slot with a deeper piece of bone and then recut those two slots where I want them. And that way I don't have to make a whole brand new nut, um, which is a very valuable technique if you have like an ivory nut. An original ivory nut and the spacing is just wacko and you don't want to ruin the ivory nut and throw it away and you can fill in just those slots with another material recut them and it will be almost invisible that's probably what i'm going to do to this nut because it'll solve two problems it'll solve the d string being too low and it'll solve the little spacing of the string problem so i'll move the a and the d over to get about sixty thousandths of an inch and then all of them will be nice and spaced evenly and I'll take care of that D slot. So, but there's a problem. Might not be a problem for you, but it's a problem for me. I'm very picky about using these space nuts. Okay. Number five. Check the frets. At this point, I know that I have my bridges out of location. I'm going to need a neck reset. I've got a little bit too much neck relief. And my nut slots are just a little too hard, plus I don't really quite like the spacing of them. So I'm going to be working on the bridge, I'm going to be doing the neck reset, I'm going to do something about the relief, and I'm going to do fine-tune the nut to my satisfaction. So the frets, since I've got to deal with the neck relief, what do the frets look like, okay?
first thing I want to do is just look at the frets. This is easy, okay? And what I'm looking for is a crown. I want those frets to come up like this and have a peak, a crown. I don't want them to come up like this and be flat topped. I don't even want them like this with a flatter radius over the top. The reason for that, the contact point of the string should be right smack in the middle of the fret. If the contact point is at the front of the fret, the guitar is going to play even sharper than it is now. So one way to do that is just look at them, but the second way is to go ahead and fret a note and get that backlight on it and look at the shadow again. And again, in this case, this is not, the shadow comes up like this and shows me a very clear um, crown on top of the fret. So that looks pretty good. Let's see how high the frets are. You can use a pair of calipers like this. I'll show you how to use the feeler gauges too. Just smack them down on there. 42. That's nice. 42. 40. A little under 40. And a little under 40. So, these frets are right around 40 thousandths of an inch, which is good. If they were 30 thousandths of an inch, that's too low. You can't get a good bite of the string when you make your fretting here, especially if you have fat fingers like me. You push down on there and the string won't make a good bite. 30 thousandths is minimum. Anything below 30, anything at 30 thousandths or below, I'm replacing frets. Okay? These frets are pretty good. Which is kind of a problem because I'd like to be able to refret it because if I refretted it, then I could use compression fretting or I could use um, taller frets and then cut my relief into it. Or I could sand the fingerboard a little bit right here in order to make it fall away and create some relief. These frets are in good shape. So probably what I'm going to do on this particular guitar to get the relief down is I'm going to pull the first five frets and I'm going to set them here on the bench and then I'm going to come in and with my radius sanding block and I'm going to go ahead and sand right here and of course I'll sand mostly on the first two frets and not very much up here so by rubbing the sanding block up and pulling it back I, I get very little sanding here and I get constant sanding over here and I'll automatically cut a curve into it we're only talking about Let's see, this was ten thousandths of an inch, and I would like to have it below five, so I'm only talking about five thousandths of an inch of sanding here at the fingerboard. But it's not much, you know, it's not, not anything that you're really going to feel. So here's five thousandths of an inch. It got bit off, it got sacrificed for a, a, a tool. And that's all, you know, you're just going to take that much off right there. You know what else that's going to do is that's going to make my nut taller because the fingerboard is going to be lower and I'm going to gain some height on those nut slots but I'm still going to fill these two in and move them over. Anyway, so your frets look good on here. I don't think it needs a full refret but I got to do something about the relief. So on this guitar I'm going to pull first five frets. That's going to get my sander come all the way up to the six which is the middle of the neck and I'm going to shape that fingerboard backwards and then it's, then it's going to stay. It'll be good. I'll get the relief down, and we'll take care of that. So, the frets. Frets look good, you know. If the relief is good, I wouldn't even touch the frets from this point. But, I've got to work on them. So, I'm going to take them out, set them here, shape the fingerboard, put those same frets back in, check all the heights and everything. They'll be good, you know. It's going to save the owner some, some money. And you, as a buyer you know that now you don't need a fret job, but you do got to deal with relief if you want a primo playing guitar. So there's going to be some expense on you, you know, and I hope you're keeping track of how much this guitar is really going to cost you. Okay, now we've gotten the main playing stuff out of the way. Let's look at everything else on this guitar. Well, it's so common people say, oh, the pickguard's peeling, you know, as if that's a, a tragedy or something. 
Uh, the, the pit guard on 70s Martins is, is very problematic. It is glued directly to the wood, then they finish over it. And the material that they use back then shrinks. So when it shrinks, it either causes cracks or it peels up like this. I'd rather see it peeled up than cause cracks. This guitar is not sunk here. Um, the pick, of, pick guard sacrificed itself here. <laughs> you gotta need a new pick guard. There's no way in the world you're gonna sh straighten this one out. Sorry, you're just not gonna do it. Come on, sis. So this pick guard's gotta come off of there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's how you take a pick guard off. That's a little bonus on the video. Um, it's been glued at some point. There's some nasty glue under here that didn't do anything. And here's your crack. You see your crack is under here. But it's under the pick guard, which is cool, so it's not going to be very visible. A little bit of a B-string crack here, which is no big deal. People are glue up the, the B-string, but, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. There's a brace here. There's a brace here. It cracked because of the pick guard, not because of some other structural sort of thing. I'm not even going to worry about that B string. Um, if it's really violent, I'd probably fill it with glue and clamp it down. That, that's so rare. I'm not even going to worry about it. So your pick guard's off, and there's no way you're saving this pick guard. It's a potato chip. When it looks like this, it's there's just no way around it. New pick guard. So there's an expense. Expense. You could go back with a with a black plastic one now. You know whatever. The way that I repair this, just quickly so you know, people have different ways of doing it, but you can see the wood's a little bit rough right here, and in any case, you, what you're going to do nowadays is use a sticky paper, a transfer paper on the back of the new pick guard, you're going to stick it on here. That way if the pick guard shrinks, it moves the tape and it doesn't crack the top. But it's not going to stick to this bare wood very well. A lot of guys will spray lacquer over that in order to create a surface that they can glue to, and that's fine. But I'm very allergic to, um, to fresh lacquer. I don't have a good place to spray in here anyways. What I use is this bottle of tight bond height glue. Smear it on here. You know, just a little, rub it down a little flat. Put the guitar over there in the corner, leave it overnight. And this stuff will really self-level really nice. And then you get your sanding block like this, just a little sanding block go over it, smooth off any little bumps or anything, and then stick your new pick guard to that. This, I mean, works great. I've had no problems with that at all. It's safe. If you ever needed to redo it for some reason, um, you just get some hot water, rub it out there, clean all the glue out, which is not true. Lacquer, you know, of course. So, all right, you got to have a new pick guard. Oh, look at this now. Let's look at the bridge. So I know I need a neck reset. I know the bridge is out of location. So now I'm going to focus on that bridge a little bit more. Has it ever been shaved? That's the question I'm going to look at. And unfortunately, this one's been shaved. I can tell by looking at it. I'm going to measure it here, but just looking at it in the guitar store, I can see that the low E and the high E are almost the same height. The bridge looks like this, and a Martin bridge should be higher on the low E side and lower over here so that it has a curve going across the top. And this one doesn't. It looks more like a Santa Cruz bridge or a Gibson bridge with a flatter on top. It's been shaved. I do not want to reset a neck to a shaved bridge because it's still not right. If I do get to... I, 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 I want it right. <laughs> I don't want to do things halfway. And, and I'm sorry it's going to cost more money, but um, maybe it's not. You know, maybe I have sympathy for you and I'll, you know, give you a cut on the price or something because I want the guitar to be right. It's got my name on it. People go, oh, Kimsey worked on this guitar. And I look at that sucky bridge, you know. I, I don't want to do that. So having determined that this bridge is low, I want to now find out how low it is. Take my calipers, I'm gonna pop it in right here next to the low E. And 
275. Let's just call it 280. I'm measuring to the bridge, not the shadow. Um, 260. See, so it's pretty close. 260 to 280 is almost flat. Well, it ought to be at least 320 over here. And I, when I make a bridge, I cut it more like 360. So 360 to 320 at minimum, 320 to 290. So this bridge is about 30 to 40 thousandths of an inch too low. And I don't like that. It's that much. It's not a whole big, tremendous, massive thing. <laughs> but I don't like it. I want, I want a full height bridge. So, and I can also tell by looking at it that the front edge is just a little sharp. Mm. You know, the corners look good. I mean, everything looks nice on that. It could possibly, maybe, be a low Martin bridge. We'll see. When I get the bridge off, because I'm going to scoot it, if I take it off to scoot it, I will remeasure it and see if I'm happy. Because there's been one or two cases where I look at it on the guitar and I thought it was too low. And then when I got it off, I just kept staring at it and I said, you know, there's just no evidence of this bridge ever being shaved. I think it's just a low bridge. Martin has several sizes of bridges that they use, you know. That might be the case with this. It might just be a low bridge. Anyway, we'll deal with it. What I can tell you is it's not the nice full height. If I hit 320 and 300, we're done, you know. Bridge looks good. So, the bridge is kind of a, kind of a wavy point right here. We might do something with it. We might not do something with it. Okay? You want to look at it. You want to look now body and the top cracks and that's where I think most people go wrong looking at a guitar you know they're all hung up on the little cracks on the body and they completely miss the bridge being on the location the cracks on the body are the gnat and this over here the bridge is the camel cracks are just cracks they really they really don't cause any problems if you glue them up and clean them they're fine this guitar though has no cracks that looks good. No cracks on the top. Got some dings. Got some finish checking. I couldn't care less about that. There's no cracks on the back. Got a little honest wear. Butt buckle rash. Who cares? No cracks over here. The binding is all really nice and tight on this guitar. You know, I'm just giving it a, a quick look over now. Man, the binding is great. You know, there's no loose binding. Nothing going on there. I'm feeling for it. Feeling for ridges. No loose binding. I don't think his neck has ever been reshot. I don't see any marks here from the drills going in. I don't see any marks back here from sandpaper. Uh, I see no evidence whatsoever of this neck having been reshot, which is neither a plus or con. It's just a, it's just something to note, you know. A lot of guys don't give a neck enough angle, so just because it's been reset once doesn't really mean anything. I'm just saying this is probably going to be the first neck we set for this guitar. So I personally know kind of what I'm going to look at here. So, no cracks on the body. The body's in good shape, really. See this stuff? This is from uh, somebody swinging hard on the, on the plane, swinging past the guitar, doing this kind of number. A little bit of wood's missing there. I would not worry about that. You know what I would do, and what I'm probably gonna do, is take some, either leave it alone, <laughs> or take some shellac, and finch polish it in there to protect the finish. And the beautiful thing about shellac is it's gonna stain it almost perfectly. It's like a chameleon. It comes in here, and it'll stain this, and you'll be able to see it, but it won't have that white, visible look to it. It'll protect the wood. Those are honest battle scars. I'm not going to do a lot, but I would personally shellac those in just a little bit. It'll blend good. Okay? Now, the bridge plate. 
<laughs> this is a 70s Martin. You want to take a look, so you already know it's got a great big rosewood bridge plate, but you should look at it. Get yourself a mirror, get yourself a flashlight, pop it in there, take a look at it. Just take a look at the interior of the guitar at this point. Look at the braces. They look like they've ever been scalloped. Has anybody messed around in there? Uh, these are really clean. There's no evidence of scalloping. There's no evidence of clamping. You use a clamp like this. And you'll see dents in the braces where somebody didn't use a call. Now again, it's, just, it's not a tragedy. It's just something you want to know about. Why were they in there clamping? This looks clean. Massive rosewood bridge plate. Which I totally expected. Nothing funky going on in there at all. Very clean. Popsicle braces here, as I expected. I'm going to look alongside the fingerboard right here for cracks. And you might not be able to see them here, but you can see them from the inside looking up. And you see them right alongside the neck block. And again, this one's really clean. No problems there. So there's not going to be any work there. If you do see cracks alongside the fingerboard, that'd be visible as dark lines. If you're curious, you can take something like this, Gugon, naphtha. You can squirt it on right here. Wipe it up. And it will leak through if there's a crack and you'll be able to see a dark spreading line immediately. If you've got a crack alongside the fingerboard, then that um, something needs to be addressed. And what I, how I address that is to remove the popsicle brace because it didn't do its job anyways and replace it with a char trapezoidal brace. It runs from the neck block, from the neck block to the sound hole brace. Fits in there very snugly. It's at an angle. It's got beveled edges and it strengthens this area, keeps it from collapsing. That's how I repair ones that are really bad. So that would be an expense that you would have to be prepared for. But this one looks great. Inside looks great. It's got a huge rosewood bridge plate which um, I can't stand. <laughs> so I'm going to recommend replacing that. All right, what else do we got here? I'm looking at my notes. I actually took notes this time. There's your guitar, basically. You know it's got tuners on it. You know it's got Grover Rotomatic tuners that weigh a ton. That's the 70s. So our basic issues on this guitar then are... Bridge is out of location. The action is really high, and that's because it needs a neck reset. The relief is a little bit high, but not enough to cause that high of an action up here. The reef probably needs to be corrected a little bit. And I'm going to probably correct that by pulling about five frets right here and working with the fingerboard on this end, and that ought to take care of it. It's going to take care of it. So, I've got to do something with the bridge. Going to need neck reset. I'm going to tweak the relief. The nut slots are just a little wonky right now. I'm going to take care of that. That's not a major deal. And the pick guard's got to be replaced. If I did all those things, we would have a 70s in great playing condition. To hop it up, make it sound better than it does now. It might sound great right now. It's hard to evaluate because the action is so high. But it might sound great right now. The owner might be just happy and I'm happy with that too. That's fine with me. The way I would start the modifications on this guitar is I'd get rid of the big rosewood bridge plate. i got nothing against rosewood bridge plates, but it doesn't have to cover up half of the lower bout. It needs to come to the about an eighth of an inch past the edge of the bridge. So I would replace the bridge plate. It'll let the top breathe a lot better. You could use maple, black locust, you could use a fancy rosewood like an Amazon um, Brazilian rosewood if you can get a blank. Southeast Asian rosewood, Honduran, I mean you can use any kind of nice fancy rosewood if you want to. I generally go with maple or black locust. Maple is a traditional, makes it sound a little opener and cleaner and clear. I would replace the tuners, I can't stand heavy go over rudder mat tuners at the end of my head stop. I want a lightweight tuner up there. When you get a lighter weight tuner, it's going to make the neck stiffer. Consequently, it's going to reduce the sustain just a little bit, but it's going to make the attack 
great. The guitar is going to pop harder just a little. It's going to pop a little harder. The trebles are going to come out just a little bit more. And the balance, the physical balance of the guitar will be so much better. It'll be back, it'll be here in the guitar rather than falling off on the headstock like that. So I would replace the tuners, and I've got videos on this, on reducing the raccoon eyes and all that stuff. But those are hop-up expenses that I would recommend. If the owner wants to scalp the braces, then I'm going to talk to him about scalping the braces. The great thing about this uh, is that you can do the tuners, and you can do all this stuff, and play the guitar, and you might not want to do the scalping of the braces. You might like that non scalp sound. You know, a lot some... D28 and 18 sound great non scallop so just depends on what you're going to do with it. So. Let's talk now about some specifics on how to deal with the bridge. So there are basically four things, four options that you can do, you can use when correcting the intonation. All of them or ugly. <laughs> Every single one of them is going to be ugly in some way or another. The one that is not ugly is going to be very expensive and is my least favorite option, really. Okay, Because of the expense, yeah, mostly because of the expense. So your four options, all of which are ugly, one is very expensive. Four options is number one, an oversized bridge. That's Martin's approach to this most of the time because what's going to have to happen is this bridge is going to have to come back an eighth of an inch. So you take the bridge off, you put it up here, and you've got a scar. You've got a finished scar up here that's an eighth of an inch wide. Martin's approach is to use an oversized bridge that covers that eighth of an inch. And, ah, oh, I can't tell you how much I hate oversized bridges. Okay, you know why I hate oversized bridges? Because it's going the wrong direction. The 30s is the holy grail. Okay, my opinion. 30s and even, let's move into the 40s even if you want to. You know, the, God, I love late 40s, Martins. Uh, 46, 47, 48, D18s, rock. But guitars in that era, this is a 1950s bridge right here in my hand. A thinner bridges. So this is a 50s bridge. And it measures 1 and 380 from front to back. Here's a 70s bridge. And it measures 1 and 420. It's 40 thousandths of an inch larger. So in my humble opinion, this is going the wrong way from this one. An oversized bridge is even worse. You know, it's going to go an eighth of an inch. Ah! And the wings, big fat monstrosities. Ah! So it looks horrible. It's going to weigh more. It's going to weigh a lot more than this bridge. This is a pretty nice lightweight little bridge here. This is Brazilian rosewood. This is what all bridges should be right here. I want you to feast your eyes on this. I've got a little marker up here on my board where I've been measuring bridges. 48 bridge is 1.380. The 50s is the same, 1.380. My 63D18 over there, which I saw immediately, I looked at it and said, that's a, man, that's a narrow bridge. 1.340. So 63 is good. 65 is 1355. That's still pretty good. 70s is 1.425. Now we're out of the zone. And a modern D18 GE is 1410. Which is, you know, not too bad. Not too bad. So, but well, anyway, I hate oversized bridges. It's going the wrong way on the bridge shape. They add weight. And the saddle sits in the middle of the bridge. So if this is an oversized bridge, the oversized stuff comes on the front right here. So now you've got a saddle that's sitting in the middle of that bridge rather than on the forward edge. Just look at the difference between these two. The 50s are sitting more forward 
in the 70s here. Now, yeah, sometimes they crack right here, <clears throat> but there's a pivoting action that happens here. Like that. And when the saddle's in the middle, it doesn't pivot like that. It's got more resistance on the front, and it doesn't want to pivot. So the oversized bridge is just going the wrong way to me. Plus, you're going to have to, when you scoot the bridge back, you're going to have to take some finish off back here. So now you, you'll never go back from an oversized bridge, you see? Because you have to take finish off on the back here to scoot the thing back. And you got this big, fat, ugly piece of ebony sitting there. And if you ever wanted to go back to the smaller bridge, you can't. Because the finish is ruined on the back side of the thing. I don't even want to talk about oversized bridge. If you want an oversized bridge, I don't want to do it. That's it. I refuse it. Unless I'm building one for one that's already an oversized bridge. And I have to put another oversized bridge in place. And even then, I would rather deal with the finished scar. Okay. Option number two. <laughs> would be to replace the fingerboard. So your problem is your scale is just a little bit too long. It's just a little bit. So you could leave the neck alone, leave the bridge alone. You could replace the fingerboard. Drop one in with a slightly shorter scale. I personally have never done that. John Arnold does it sometimes. Um, he likes that option. I don't like it that much just because it's a lot of work. And... You know, I have to get a fingerboard that's size correctly. I've got to refret it. I've got to transfer the dots over it. I've got to pull the fingerboard off. I've got to redo the finish right here on the edge that I messed up, you know, taking the fingerboard off. Um, I don't, like, well, there's other options I would rather do. But it is an option, you know. It's almost invisible if you do it right, which is the challenge. If you do it right, no one would ever know. Oh, you got a slightly different fret spacing in there. The 15th fret's going to be just a hair different, but no one's going to know. My most common option, and the one that I tend to do the most, is to scoot the bridge back. Now, <clears throat> take the bridge off. It's got to come back an eighth of an inch. So that's going to leave a finished scar at the front of the bridge. Remember I told you everything is ugly here. Oversized bridges are the ugliest thing in the world. The fingerboard is not bad. You'd be hard pressed to see that, but it's expensive. You're going to pay me for removing the fingerboard, putting the fingerboard on there, transferring the dots, doing a full refret job, getting the neck relief right, uh, making a new nut. <laughs> you know, it's going to be $500 for that. If you want to pay that, you can pay that. It's expensive. My preference is to scoot the bridge back. The reason I like to do that is because it moves the bridge back on the X braces. <laughs> and if you know that your 30s, Martins, your pre-wars, you know that the X brace is forward shifted and the bridge is further back. By scooting this back an eighth of an inch, you start moving in the right direction there. You're moving the bridge farther back, farther away from the X, and you get a little bit more of an open sound as a result of that. The X itself doesn't move, so you're not quite exactly there, but you're moving it farther back on the X braces, which shifts it back here just a little bit more. You know, to me, that's moving the right direction. Now, we're going to shift the bridge back an eighth of an inch. We know, because I already showed you, I already went through the numbers, we know that the 50s bridge is thinner front to back than the 70s bridge. So what I like to do is take your 70s bridge here and cut it down to the width of the 50s bridge or a little thinner and I can validly do that because the 40s was 1.380 and the 63 was 1340 which gives me Gosh, that gives me 80 thousandths of an inch to work with. That's a lot. And that's a valid thing because Martin used that bridge on that 63 um, D18. So I'm only doing what Martin did. So I can thin this bridge down pretty close to an eighth of an inch. What that means then is that I'll have to do very little, if any, 
finish removal on the back of the bridge. I'm going to thin the bridge down and scoot it down and backwards into the same hole. Thinner bridge is the way to go, in my humble opinion, because that's what the 50s was, that's what the 30s was, that's what the 63 was. They're all thinner bridges. Going to a fatter bridge is the wrong way to go. So I get, look at how many advantages now. I get to go with the bridges in the correct location, first of all, so you're in tune. Secondly, it's farther back on the X-braces, so it sounds more open and just a little bit more like a 30s would do. I get to use a thinner bridge, which I think is the way to go, and that is also going to make it lighter. And I haven't disturbed the finish very much on the back side here, so all your original finish is there. So if you ever wanted to go back to a stop bridge, all you have to do is pull my bridge off, scoot your bridge forward again, drop it back on there, and you can happily play out of tune again for the rest of your life. So to me, that has a lot of uh, advantages. The single disadvantage is there's going to be a finish scar on the front. Well, I can repair that, you know, and I can hide it pretty good. This guitar is going to be a little tougher <laughs> because it's a sunburst. But uh, fortunately, it's still amber colored here in the middle. It's not dark. If it was, well, if it was black, it'd be, it'd be all right, you know. But it's not going to be quite as good as a natural top, but it's not going to be bad. So scooting the bridge back is not a bad option. It's going to have a finished scar, but I can make those look pretty good. I'll go get a couple out here in just a second and show you. I can make them look pretty good generally. And like I said, everything is ugly. Every option is ugly. So to me, the advantages of scooting the bridge with one slight bit of ugliness, which really is temporary, because you could revert if you wanted to. That's worth it. Uh, this is a 70s D41, and it had a bridge in the, in the wrong location. I decided on this one because the top's got some... It's got enough finish cracks and, you know, et cetera. Plus, it's your normal yellowish top. And I'm replacing the bridge plate in this one. So, given those combination of things, a new bridge plate, um, it's going to have a neck reset when I get done here. But given these combinations of things, I decided to scoot the bridge back on this one. I did all the tricks I told you about. I shortened the bridge up uh, this way. And I did a finish repair on there. I'm going to show you this one because this one is average. Sometimes when you get the bridge off, you'll find discoloration and staining down there. And that's what I found on this one. It had some orange discoloration. And I worked on it and scraped it and sanded it and bleached it. Got it as good as I could, but it's got some coloration. So I want to show you this one because it's not one of the best ones I've done. It's not one of the worst. It's a little bit on the average. It's a little bit on the average. Um, and this is what a scooted bridge looks like. And, and I have not even gone in and sanded it yet and touched it up or anything like that. This is pretty well as worse as it's ever going to look. And when you get your strings on here, You'd be surprised how, how, how well that's going to blend in. It'll look like, like a shadow, almost. And so let's get it closer to the camera so you can see what it looks like. All righty. That's a scooted bridge. That's what I do most of the time. I would say 70%. I'd say close to 80% of my 70 bridge issues are dealt by scooting the bridge back. Because like I said, in this case, I'm doing a bridge plate too. So, you know, that's all the more reason. I've got to drill new holes and everything. All the more reason to go back. Put that bridge where it should be. Goes back further in the X braces. i got a new bridge plate in there. i get the bridge plate lined up with the bridge. i get everything where I want it. The intonation is going to be 100% correct. And in this case... I decided to scoot the bridge. I could scoot the bridge on the other ones too, you know, on the sunburst one that we've been looking at, or on this real pretty one over here. Um, I could do that. But, I think I'm going to shim it. I'm going to shim that one. I'm not sure what we're going to do on the sunburst one. Yeah, we'll talk to the owner on that. 
now that he's seen the options and you know that kind of thing. I'm gonna lay my yardstick down here on the 12th fret, which I refretted, and that comes, bingo. There's my red mark right at the back edge of the saddle, which is where I want it. And the same here. And it comes to the front here, 11 1 8 of an inch perfectly. Of course it's perfect, you know. 11 and 8 of an inch. So I skewed it back an eighth of an inch. Now, my fourth option. One that I have been doing, and I might consider doing on this guitar. We discuss it with the owner. I am doing it with another guitar over here, which let me go get this guitar. This is a second guitar. This is also a 70s D28. It has a natural chop. The pickguard is amazingly not warped and cracked. Um, I wonder if it's been re-glued or re uh, replaced. I don't know, it looks original, but... Beautiful top. Mmm, man. I hate to scoot the bridge on this one. I will. But there's another option here. Okay? And this is a pretty good option. So when I look at a guitar like this, it's got a really beautiful top on it. Not much, just a little checking, you know, a little few scrapes here and there. But on the whole, the finished scar is really going to mar this guitar. The other one's got the pick scratches down here, you know. It's got more dings and scratches and, you know, more character. But this one's nice. I've had a few that are even nicer than this. So the option I offer to the, those customers is this. I'll shin the neck back. It needs a neck reset. So what I do is glue in one eighth of an inch mahogany shims right here on the neck, like that, and I'm going to build my neck reset into those shims. Now the shims are visible. Like I said, every option is ugly. But the thing about this, and so I don't even try to really, you know, I, I color them so they're not white. If it's a D18, sometimes I'll make them black because it goes good with the black fingerboard and the black binding on here and the black binding on there and I'll just make a black shim and put it in there. But I don't try to hide it too much and I know it's not going to be hidden. The thing about this option here is that only you will see it. So you're going to go in like this. Of course this neck isn't fit yet. And it's not tapered yet either. But you're the only person that sees these shims. You're standing here playing. You look down there and, and you know, you'd be surprised how well hidden they are by the time I get done with this. The top looks normal. There's no scars up over here. A really close inspection is going to show a little bit of fuzziness going on right here because the fingerboard's back. This is D35. <laughs> the fingerboard is back a little bit. And so you're going to have a little bit of this showing. But again, I can clean that up. And you'll be hard pressed, you know, you certainly are not going to see it from across the room. If you have it in your hand, you look at it and you go, that neck seems like it's a little bit further back. Yeah, it's an eighth of an inch further back. The 15th fret doesn't line up right on the edge of the fingerboard right anymore, or right on the edge of the body. But again, it's a small thing. The big advantage about this, shimming it like this, is you don't do any damage to the guitar. There's no damage to the guitar. I have not taken the bridge off. I haven't taken any finish away. In this case, I might not even do the bridge plate on this guitar. It's got a K&K &K pickup on it. And I'll have to get that K&K &K off of there. I've got to do the bridge plate. Well, we're discussing that right now. But I've done no damage to the guitar. If this guitar ever became historically significant a guy could come in here and take the neck off remove my shims put that neck right back where it was and it would be 100 percent original again so that's something you can't say when you've scooted the bridge and um, put an oversized bridge on it put a different fingerboard on it that kind of thing so you know that's an option i've done this probably half a dozen times this year for one reason or another, I didn't want to take the bridge off. I didn't want to scoot the bridge. And for one reason or another, I decided to shim it. Pretty good. I mean, the guys are happy with it. Nobody's looked at it and said, oh, God, that's ugly. I wish they had done that. Nobody said that. And, of course, on this one, I've got to get the end cap in here. 
which I'll do after I'm all done with it all. I, once I've got it fitted to the neck and everything's nice and fitted, then I'll come in here and I'll make a new little white end cap spacer, which again you can see, but it's okay because it tells me, oh, this neck tie has a shim in it. You know, I need to be aware of that as a repair person. So, what's your fourth option? Shim the neck back. I think that's what we're going to do to this one. All right, there's your options on um, 70s dealing with the 70s bridge issues four options basically oversized bridge i don't even want to talk about that anymore replace the fingerboard it's a good option it's expensive not original um it's a good option it's an option it's expensive scoot the bridge back that's the one i use most of the time especially if i'm going to do it in conjunction with a bridge plate widening the bridges uh, the, uh, widening the pinholes, like say I'm going from a two and an eighth to two and a quarter inch spacing. Anytime I'm going to do anything to the bridge plate or the bridge itself, I'm going to really strongly consider scooting that bridge backwards. And the last option is going to be shimming the neck. And I tend to shim the neck when I have a really, really pristine looking top. Or, yeah, anytime I have a pristine looking top or I'm not going to touch the bridge plate. So if I don't want to disturb the bridge system, then I'm going to shift the whole neck backwards. And again, the advantage of that is I've done no damage to the guitar and all the original stuff is there. So it's a valid option. And it works, you know. Works fine. I guess there's a fifth option, which I have never done, never played about, but I think about it um, at 3 a.m. in the morning when I'm thinking about these things. And that would be... To put an ebony shim up here at the nut. So that's basically the same thing as going to a smaller fingerboard. You're shifting the tuning location. I don't know how well that's going to work. And one of these days I'm going to, I'm going to do it. And what I would do is make a one eighth of an inch. Or what, I'm not sure it's even going to be an eighth of an inch. I have to figure that out. And here's your nut. And glue this in right here. So that now I have shortened the fingerboard. And I don't think, I've, I've done some work with nut compensation by working it backwards. This is basically really, if you think about it, it's the Irvana nut concept. You put your shim in right here, and you would tune forward of where the nut is. You still get your bone nut back there, but you'd be getting the tone of ebony, because the strings would be on the ebony. You could run bone up there, but that'd look really ugly, you know? I would rather have ebony make it stealth. I don't think the tone of ebony is going to hurt anything. So you got an ebony strip right here. Put it in here. Glue it down to the fingerboard. The strings are going to come off the top. I think the main disadvantage of that is going to be that the ebony is going to wear faster. It might not. I don't know. It's going to look ugly. <laughs> you're going to have an ebony thing there, you know. And you're going to have the short scale, which is something when you move the bridge back and or scoot the neck, you get the longer scale. Of course, it's correct. The longer scale um, sounds different than the shorter scale. So anytime you use the fingerboard, you're dealing with the shorter scale. When you shim the nut up here like this, you're still dealing with the short scale. The longer scale... Um, has a different tone, which I think most people are going to associate. You can hear that tone with the dreadnought sound. It's a top sound, it's not a loose. Think about an OM versus a triple dot, the difference there. You know, on the other hand, you've got a looser string feel, so maybe you like that. But, well, that fifth option is one I haven't really done yet. You can be the guinea pig if you want to. So, anyway, okay. Let's repair work. Purpose of this video, one more time, was for you to use so that you know what to look for when you're buying a used 1970s Martin 14 fret dreadnought. The first thing you're going to look at, you're going to check the bridge location. The second thing you're going to look at is you're going to check the action at the 12th fret. See what you think about that. Then, if it's good, you're great. You're done, you know. I would check the neck relief, regardless. I would check the net height, regardless. And then I would take a good look at the pick guard, see what the pick guard's doing. Take a look inside, 
see what the bridge plate looks like, see what the braces look like, see if the braces have been messed with. And then finally, you can start turning the guitar over and looking at the back and the sides and the, you know, cracks and the, you know, anything like that that you want to do. And then we'll look at the frets. Look at the frets when you're looking at the neck relief. So like neck relief, then your frets, then your neck. And those are your things. Your most valuable tool, in my humble opinion, feel gauge. You can do so much with this feel gauge. You can measure the fret height, you know. You can make a little stack like this, and you can measure the clearance under the string. You can tell how tall the frets are. You carry these in your pocket. You can, you can make a keychain out of them, you know. Feeler gauges. I have a piece of yellow tape on mine, so I can find them anywhere. Feeler gauges. Great stuff. A little bit of tape measure. 13 inches. All you need to go is from the fret to here. Measure that sucker. It's just not that difficult. Yeah? Okay. This is a long video. I hope this helped you somewhat. And, um, I don't know, leave me some comments. See ya.